just about every series or line of kits had proposed editions that were shelved when sales of the earlier kits started to slip. Many of these follow-up kits never went past the drawing board stage, but a surprising number actually got as far as finalized patterns. The Imperial Japanese Navy Akagi and HMS Ark Royal aircraft carriers made it as far as tooling patterns. The world's first atomic-powered commercial ship, the NS Savannah, also got scuttled. Quickly released kits of the ship by both Adams and Ravel might have been the reason. The last planned addition to the 148 scale armored fighting vehicle line was the Sheridan. Earlier cancellations to the military line were a half track and a self propelled 155 millimeter gun. Research aircraft. Some of the experimental lifting body aircraft were seriously considered by Aurora. Because of the small size of the real Northrop and Martin aircraft, the kits would have been to 148 scale and would have featured interior details such as engines and fuel tanks. Although many Aurora aircraft kits are collector's items today, the Lockheed XFV-1 vertical takeoff is one that's usually at the top of the list. Original plans for the kit included a special display stand in the form of a billowing exhaust blast that would hold the model in the vertical position. It's well known that Aurora's model of the Hiller X-18 was created by Comet, but did you know that the kit was reissued in the mid-1970s as part of a Kit of the Month Club deal and that all the molded markings were removed? Unfortunately, none of the other design mistakes were corrected. Unmanned. During the space race of the 1950s, Aurora produced several kits of missiles and rockets. Once again, Aurora took a slightly different approach from its competitors by offering a couple of missiles, Beaumark and Regulus II, both with and without launchers. A third subject, the Martin Mace, was even more unusual in that no launcher was ever offered. The 148 scale kit featured only the Mace and Aurora's standard aircraft display stand, but the famous Terra Cruiser launcher transporter for the Mace was part of the original plan. The appearance of the 132nd scale Renwall kit may have killed Aurora's smaller Terra Cruiser. Also planned was a 148 scale Honest John missile with its truck launcher, the same type that Adams did in 1 to 40 scale. An alternate proposal had the Honest John mounted on Aurora's existing tracked munitions carrier. That combination would have been inaccurate, but tooling cost would have been much less. Aurora's cancellation of the SM-73 Goose kit probably coincided with the U.S. Air Force's decision to terminate the real ECM missile. In the late 1960s, Aurora put renewed interest in aircraft kits and started to take a more serious approach to detail and scale. But, as designers were coming off the drawing boards and new patterns were starting to be tooled up, Aurora got a new president and company policy changed drastically. Orders were given to stop work on all aircraft projects except those already in advanced stages of tooling. The DC-10 was one that was well on its way and had to be completed at minimum cost. Final detailing, however, was never completed. Canceled projects included a 148 scale F-14 Tomcat. As a side note, Grumman was only about a half hour drive from Aurora. And a 172nd scale version of the EA-6A electric intruder. To prevent confusion, the EA-6A was called the electric intruder and was the two seat predecessor to the four seat EA-6B Prowler. They also canceled an F-106, a Viggen, a MiG-25 Foxbat, and a Yak-28 Firebar. These last two fighters were the beginning of a new series of Russian aircraft that would have included bombers and helicopters. One person who was in the middle of all of these aircraft cancellations was Ray Haynes. Haynes was Aurora's original kit mastermind and manager. 
He was also the H in HMS Associates, which was the company that did all of the early kit design work and patterns for Aurora. He had been the driving force behind the general aviation airplane kits that were outlined in episode one of the Aurora Files. Ray was also calling the shots on the last batch of aircraft kits that were squashed by Aurora's president, Chuck Diker. This included the F-106 Delta Dart. When Ray first showed the pattern that HMS created for the Delta Dart to Andrew Yanchis, Andrew pointed out that the F-106 was never painted up in camouflage. Ray replied, the kids will love it. So even though Aurora had started on a more realistic and accurate approach to airplane models, it was still thought necessary to go with gimmicks that Ravel and Monogram would never consider. Andrew Anchis suffered another disappointment in regards to the twin Mustang kit. He says, A particularly painful cancellation for me was the 172nd North American F-82. This kit got started when I asked Ray Haynes why we weren't doing any new World War II aircraft. Haynes replied, They've all been done. Andrew anticipated this response and replied, but what about the twin Mustang? Before he knew it, the project was on. The pattern was at the tooling shop and mold layout drawings were completed when Chuck Dyker's across the board cancellation was given. This was about four years before Monogram released their kit of the plane. People often wonder where kit model companies get their reference material. There are many sources and here is an interesting story about one of them. Aviation Week and Space Technology was part of Aurora's Research and Development Reference Library. Subscriptions to the famous aviation magazine varied in price, with the individuals and firms directly involved in the aerospace business entitled to the lowest rate. On Aurora's subscription application, hobby kit product manager Jim Keeler listed Aurora as, quote, manufacturer of miniature aircraft components, end quote. It worked, and they got the cheapest rate. Well, that's all the Aurora behind-the-scenes information for this installment of the Aurora Files. We'll see you next time.